John chapter 9. We'll look at the first 12 verses, uh, and yet we will also take into consideration the rest of the story uh, that unfolds in this gospel, uh, focusing really on something we will consider in verse 9 as a context for the rest of the chapter. And as you may recall last week, we took time to note that John and his gospel makes theological points through his narratives of Jesus's miracles. In fact, he doesn't call them miracles, he calls them signs. And we read at the end of his book that he has written these things, he has selected what he has given to you and to me, that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ. And so he weights all of his narratives and especially his sign narratives, his miracle stories, he weights them with theological freight. And so that's really how we're going to be looking at this story, not so much as the simple biological restoration of the man's sight. He was born blind, and yet Jesus heals him. Such a thing, as he says at the end of his story, has the world ever seen such a thing? And we will be looking more at the theological implications, both for what happened to this man and how it might be a testimony to us, the church, today. So first, let's begin reading the first 12 verses. Now, as Jesus passed by, now that continues right from verse 59 of the previous chapter, Jesus got in a heated discussion with the Pharisees and the temple officials, and it says they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. And thus it continues straightway. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is not this he who sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He's like him or he looks like him. He said, I am. Therefore, they said to him, How were your eyes opened? He answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay, and anointed my eyes, and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I received sight. Then they said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. Now, the story goes on how he is confronted by the Pharisees and the religious leaders. He was healed on the Sabbath, and so they make much to do of that fact. Whoever healed you must be a Sabbath breaker. Whoever healed you could not have done this by God, because if he had, he wouldn't have done it on the Sabbath. And they confront this man, and the exchange is so negative that they end up expelling him officially from the synagogue that he was a part of. Now, his, his parents had feared such a thing would happen to them. So when they were confronted about the miracle, they said, well, you ask him, he's of age. Apparently this man was uh, of an age that they could have thought, well, let's go ask his parents. He apparently wasn't too old. And so when he is confronted, it doesn't go well for him. And he ends up being expelled by his community, his synagogue. And so what I want to look at today is really this idea of identifying with Christ. What it is to become a Christian, what it is to accept the gospel, what it is to have our eyes opened to the light of Jesus Christ. 
And it is interesting here how the man, as John tells the story in verse 9, he says, I am. I'm the one. But the words he uses and the phrase he employs as John writes this story, I think are, are no coincidence, no mistake. I think John very specifically uses the words that he uses here in the Greek, ego eimi, I am. Now, to a Jewish person of that day, these words conjure up the story of the burning bush where Moses speaks to Yahweh. And when Moses says, who should I say sent me? Tell him, I am that I am has sent you. And here, this man says, I am. Now we might say, well, he's just stating fact. However, only a few verses earlier, right there at the end of the previous chapter in verse 58, Jesus says, before Abraham was, ego eimi. Before Abraham was, I am. And there is no mistaking what Jesus is intending to say there. He is going back to Genesis to the time of Abraham, and he is saying that I am greater than Abraham. I am. Right away, linking to the voice of the burning bush. And it is interesting, in this gospel, you won't find another person using this term. And certainly, John had many opportunities to have that term employed as just a regular figure of speech, but he does not. He uses the figure of speech, especially in this way, only on the lips of Christ with this one exception. And so I suggest to you that as John has already used this phrase, I am, to remind us of the voice of Yahweh at the burning bush. And as John has placed these words on the lips of Jesus as the light of the world, when he says ego eimi in chapter 8, he says, I am the light of the world. I am the light of that burning bush, and I am the light of the world today. The voice of God is the voice that speaks through me. And so as John has been careful to theologically manipulate these words, and to bring into our thoughts and minds the voice of Yahweh as it is seen in the life of Christ. I can't help but wonder if John had a point and an intention of what he has done here by placing these very theologically freighted words onto the lips of the man born blind when he has received his sight. In a sense, is he not through John's story, identifying himself with Christ. I was blind, now I see, he will say in verse 25, who healed you? Well, I don't know where he is, I don't know what he looks like, but a man called Jesus, he's the one that gave me my sight. And the rest of the chapter is his testimony of Jesus Christ. The rest of the chapter is his witness for Jesus Christ. The rest of the chapter is about his identity as it is wrapped up in Jesus Christ. So much so, because he is one with Christ, he is expelled from the synagogue. And this goes well with the rest of the New Testament. Through this literary device... John causes the man to be identified explicitly and theologically and spiritually with the ultimate I am with Christ. Paul uses similar language, does he not? I am crucified with Christ. The life that I now live in the flesh, it's not me that's living, but it's Christ who lives in me. Paul is often speaking of our union with Christ and that we are one in Christ. We have been united with him in his death, in baptism, and in his resurrection to eternal life. Paul would say, for me to live is Christ. My life is bound up in his life. In John chapter 17, the same author that we have here will then have Jesus praying there the night that he would be arrested, praying that his disciples would be one, just as Jesus and his Father are one. Lord, let them be one, as I am in them, and you are in me. Let them be one in us. 
So this idea that the man suddenly, through John's theological storytelling, becomes one with Christ, identified with Christ, using words that only Christ has uttered in this gospel previously, seems to be something where we are on solid ground to consider. He is a witness for Christ. He is, at this point, standing in for Christ, who will be noticeably absent for the rest of the story until Christ himself comes and finds the man. Then we should also consider John's theological portrait of salvation. Before we consider the positives and the negatives, we will see the positives of this man's experience, his conversion, his eyesight physically given to him, and then also the negative ramifications of what it came to mean to him to be identified with Christ. But before that, I think we should consider how does John present salvation to us? How does John present the gospel to us? What is the gospel according to John? And specifically of confessing Jesus as the Messiah. That really seems to summarize John's idea. That's what he says at the end of his book. I write these things so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah. First of all, in this story, we see that the man is considered to be born in sin. The disciples talk about this. Uh, who sinned, Rabbi? D did he sin in the womb before he was born? Or did his parents sin? Now, Jesus ignores that question and speaks only of the glory of God that he has been brought to, to work out. But later on, the Pharisees also bring this up. And so we can see it's part of the, the cultural milieu that, that this gospel is written in. This is the way that these people thought in those days. Jesus' disciples weren't strange to think such things. Their leaders think the exact same thing as we see in verse 34. You were completely born in sins, they tell him. And as we will see in a different study, John speaks of being born in sin and being under the consequences of sin as blindness. This is true spiritual blindness. So we are born in sin, and we are born blind to God's light. What is that light? John speaks about it in his opening, in his prologue, and he develops it throughout his gospel. Jesus is the light of God brought to the world, sent to the world. Jesus is the light of the world. And yet John, picturesquely, is painting a portrait. Okay, here is what conversion is like. You are born in sin. You are born in darkness. You are blind to the light of God. You are blind to all of the goodness and grace of God. You, you're blind. You, you are dead while you live, to use the words of Paul. And then the man is healed. He says, I know that I was blind and now I see. And I know it was Jesus who gave me sight. And he goes on, I don't know much else. I don't even know what this guy looks like. I don't know where he went. I don't really know how this has happened. But I know that it was Jesus. And this is contrasted with the spiritual leaders of the day who are supposed to have the light of God. The, the Pharisees, who were the righteous of the righteous, these were the people that you looked to to sort of measure your life by. I need to be more like those Pharisees. They take God's word seriously. That They really obey the word of God. They, they live out God's word. These were the men who were to teach others how to follow God. They were supposed to have the light. And yet, notice the theological and spiritual contrast they provide. We have a man who was born blind and these Pharisees who can otherwise see. They, they, they don't have a physical malady to overcome, and yet they cannot see what this blind man witnesses to. They cannot see what has been revealed to the man born blind. 
Though this blind man now sees, those who are seeing are blind to what he's telling them. They are blind to their sin, as Jesus will point out later. They are blind to God's light. They reject the testimony of this blind man that Jesus could be the Christ, that the work that has been accomplished in restoring this man's sight has been done by God, they refuse to admit. They will not confess such a thing. This man is a sinner. They, as far as they're concerned, Jesus is a blasphemer. He's a Sabbath breaker. He's leading people astray. So they're blind to their sin. They're blind to God's light, that Christ, that the Messiah is Jesus. And as Jews, they are even blind to the truth of Moses. Now they get in a scuffle with this man after he has received his sight. And they tell him in verse 28 that we are disciples of Moses. We follow Moses. It looks like you're starting to follow this man who healed you. You're starting to follow Jesus as if he's the Messiah. We don't follow Jesus. We follow Moses. We're not disciples of Jesus. We're disciples of Moses. But John in his gospel up to this point has, has emphasized that Moses rightly understood is only another witness to the person of Jesus that he is the Messiah. Moses is a witness to Jesus. And if you cannot see that, then you are blind to the truth of God, even as it was revealed to Moses. Throughout John's gospel, Moses, his name has been brought up several times. And John is always careful to explain to us that Moses testified of Jesus, that Jesus is the Messiah. And so these Pharisees, although they can see physically, they are blind to their sin. They are blind to God's light, that Jesus is the Messiah. They are blind to the truth of Moses, who's also a witness to Jesus as the Messiah. And they are blind to the truth as they persecute followers of the truth. They persecute this man. They do not treat him right. They mock him, they condemn him, and they expel him. It says in verse 28, he is reviled by them. They condemn him as a completely sinful man in verse 34, and they expel him later in that same verse. So here we are. These men who can see physically are quite blind spiritually and theologically and scripturally. They cannot see what this man born blind can now see quite clearly. And so that leads us really to these results of identifying with Christ the results of conversion. And I think we can go ahead and speak of conversion because at the end of the chapter, when Jesus seeks out this man and meets this man, he worships Jesus. He believes that Jesus is the Messiah. And so this is the picture of a conversion experience. And yet, what has it cost this man to identify with somebody, let me put it this way, who he's never seen. Somebody who he does not know. All he knows is that there's a man called Jesus and he opened my eyes. But I've never seen him. He, until the very end of that chapter, he does not know what Jesus even looks like. He has been touched by the hand of Jesus. He has been healed, we might say redeemed by Christ. But he does not yet really know him. It reminds me of Peter's words in one of his letters where he says, Jesus whom you love though you've never seen. So this man is a stand-in really for all converts throughout the years of the church. People who have been touched by the hand of Jesus, who have had their eyes open to his Messiahship, who have been saved by Christ, who believe in his truth, that he is the light of God, that he is the light of the world, that he is the one who has given them light and truth, that he is the way. It's 
It's the same for all of those ever since who have come to believe that Jesus is the Christ. He is a stand-in for even us today. And as John wrote to his audience way back in the first century, they could identify with him. They could identify as having been touched by the Lord that they had never seen, having been redeemed by Christ that they had never known, and yet being touched by him in such a way that it revolutionized their life. And they could also understand, as perhaps some of us can, especially those who are persecuted around the world can, that sometimes identifying with Christ means an end to any comfort or any community that you ever knew before. This man, though he was certainly uh, uh, someone pitied just the day previous, if he was kicked out of the synagogue, sounds like he used to attend the synagogue. So no doubt people would say, oh, that poor man, born blind. And perhaps even some of these Pharisees, although through their prism of God's judgment and how God deals with sin, they saw him as deserving as blindness, no doubt. It seems to be how they looked at things, much like Job's friends. If you're suffering, it must be because you're being judged. That's how they saw it. But no doubt pitied him. Oh, that poor man being judged by God. Glad it's not me. And suddenly, rather than the object of pity, he becomes the object of scorn and ridicule and expulsion. No longer to be part of his community. Now today, if one of us was to get kicked out of a church, we'd probably hardly care. Right? You go to the next church. Right? In fact, Christians today don't have to be kicked out of church. We just leave. <laughs> right? Nobody has to kick us out. We just get bored and don't want to be there anymore. Somebody looks at us cross-eyed and we're like, that's it for me. No longer. We, we can't hardly get out of church fast enough. But you got to go back to the first century. You got to go back to a time when religion tied people together through family ties and through communal ties. And it was something extremely important to be part of. It was not something to be shunned. It was not something to leave voluntarily. And if you were expelled, people in your community, well, they're not going to associate with you. I'm not going to let anybody in my synagogue know that I was associating with someone who was expelled from the synagogue. They're not going to call me a sinner. So we have to put ourselves in those shoes, in those sandals. So different from how we view our religious life today. And so John's audience could understand what it was like to be persecuted for accepting Jesus as Messiah. Christians around the world, especially those in Muslim countries, uh, we hear about persecution even in India uh, under Hinduism of Christians. There are so many Christians who really understand if I do this, if I accept Christ, if I follow Christ, and if I make a public commitment to him, it will be the end of my family ties, of my community ties. It will be the end of life as I know it. I will have to now figure out how to live life in a vastly different way. And no doubt, that's why the church family became so dear to the earliest saints. Because it truly did become their new community, their new family, where they could have refuge with people who also believed in Christ and people who also understood what it was like to be ostracized from what they previously knew. And so he's a stand-in for us. He's a stand-in as a witness for Christ. He is a stand-in as one who is in union with this Christ, even though he has never seen him yet. And so the negative results, mockery, condemnation, expulsion, a, a shaking up of his whole life. But then there's the positive, right? He can see Jesus healed him. I mean, that's incredible. That's amazing. And this man even says towards the end of his exchange that has anything like this ever been seen in the world? In verse 32, since the world began, has anyone ever heard of such a wonderful miracle? And he gains a knowledge of Jesus Christ through this. It's limited quite a bit at first. He just knows I was blind. I can see. I know it was Jesus who did this, Jesus who opened my eyes, but that's about all he knows. But his knowledge begins to increase. And he becomes a witness for Christ 
even before he meets the Lord Jesus with his opened eyes. So these are positive spiritual theological things. And notice his persecution, his affliction, his knowledge as it's increasing, his witness as a public testimony eventually lead him to a face-to-face -face meeting with Christ. It sort of reminds me a little bit of the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who in the fire is when they met the Son of God. This man is going through sort of the community fire. He's being tried by those of his town, those of his synagogue. He's going through, for this man, a very real affliction. And going through it is when he meets the Lord Jesus who comes and reveals himself in a greater way to him, so much so that he falls to his feet and worships him. The point I want to make as we are considering this chapter in a theological framework is how do we view salvation? What does the gospel mean to us? Well, what is it to us to be a Christian or to put it in another way, as we've been speaking, what is it for us to be identified with Jesus Christ? To be publicly identified as one of his witnesses. To be identified as one who has had their eyes opened. While the world around us can't see what we see, while the world around us is ignorant and blind to the salvation of Jesus Christ, to his person, to his glory, Yet we have had our eyes opened. How do we view this experience? How do we consider it? What do we think about it? Because it really does matter in the long run of our walk with Christ, how we view these things. Let me explain more what I mean. Is the gospel about living our best life now? Is it about becoming a better me? You're becoming a better you? It's about successful living? Some might even say prosperous living? Is it developing as a person professionally, personally, spiritually? Is this what we think of the gospel? In other words, what it can do for us. What it can do for me. How it calms my anxieties, perhaps how it's sort of a, a, a stand-in for AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, right? Because they have problems that they understand, uh, drunkenness in that case, but they're looking for that higher power to help them be a better person. Now, there's nothing wrong in and of itself to want to develop as a person and to mature. The Bible encourages us to mature in Christ, to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. But when we make it that self-absorbed, I think we err. I don't think the Bible is on our side when we begin to make salvation a sort of self-help mechanism. What is salvation? If we only view it as a self-help mechanism, and this is really why so many people will say, well, it's a personal thing between me and the Lord. That's why I really don't go to church. It's personal. Uh, no, I don't really get involved in the Bible. It's personal. It's spiritual. This is, this is my spiritual walk with God. This kind of spirituality fails under pressure. Because if God, or Jesus, or the Holy Spirit, whatever terms you use, and so often those types of people will use the word God, you rarely hear them talk in personal ways about Jesus or the Spirit working in their lives. But when God doesn't quite live up to his promises, when they're not as successful as they thought they were going to be if they just lived by the book of Proverbs, when they continue to lose their temper with their kids, when they thought they would really be personally uplifted by going to church and hearing a pleasant message from the pastor. Suddenly, under affliction, this type of foul salvation, this type of false religious experience, quickly fades and is easily forsaken. 
it, it's as if it was never there in the first place. And like a dog returning to its vomit or the pig returning to the mud, off we go. Because this is not salvation as the scripture describes it. Jesus didn't say, I, I came to seek and to save those who were anxious. I, I came to seek and to save those who weren't doing well in their professional careers. I, I came to seek and to save and to give help to those who were struggling in their marriages. These things are important. But is that the gospel? You see, the Bible, John's gospel speaks of the gospel as life from the dead. From spiritual darkness, we've been brought into spiritual light. From the lies of the world, we have now accepted the truth of Jesus Christ. It is becoming more like him, being sanctified by the Spirit, being transformed from glory to greater glory, not so that we can be more successful, but so that we can be more Christ-like. How was Christ successful in this world? He was successful by suffering the will of God. He was successful by accomplishing all that God gave him to do so that in his death from the cross, he could say, it is all finished. I came to do his work and I have fulfilled it. That is success. I suggest to you a Christian can be successful even when their spouse leaves them. I suggest to you a Christian can be successful even when their kids seem to be rebellious. I suggest to you a Christian can be successful and accomplish what God has given them to do without getting a promotion at work, without having all the likes on social media, without having all the followers on TikTok. I suggest to you there is a success measured by Scripture, measured by the life of Christ, that is upside down from what we measure as success. Or perhaps I should say right side up, because we are upside down. We are the blind who don't see the light. But you see, if the gospel is this, if the gospel is following Christ, becoming more like Christ, and serving Christ as Savior and King, if the gospel and salvation and conversion is identifying with him so that, like Paul, we could say, he is my life, for me to live is Christ. It's, there's an equal sign. Me equals him. If that is the gospel, if that is the Christian life you are living, then under affliction you will endure. Then under affliction you will mature. Then under affliction you will grow in Jesus and in his word, in his wisdom. You will be sanctified by his spirit. And under affliction and in times of pressure and trial, you will develop a testimony of light that shines brightly in the darkness that surrounds you. This is something worth living for. The Bible tells us over and over again, if we live for ourselves or adopt a gospel which is quite self-absorbed and selfish, it won't last. It will fade away. It won't endure. But if it is bound up in Christ, in his heart, in his will, and in his word, then it can never be taken away from us. No one could ever push us away from it. There's nothing that could ever move us from marching onward to the kingdom of heaven where our Christ reigns as king. And so, who are we? What do we think about the gospel? We are born blind in sin, yet we have been healed to see the light of Christ. That is who some of those who call themselves Christians are. They have truly been healed and redeemed and they see the light of Christ and they cannot get over it. They have, they have seen the king. They are marching for his kingdom. There is nothing that could stir them to go back to the darkness. But there is another kind of professing Christian who is blind to the light even now. 
and we'll consider that as we go forward next week in our study. As we consider the righteous Pharisees, the religious leaders who were blind to the truth of Christ. And I suggest to you, just by reading the headlines that I see day after day, week after week, just as you do, of the embarrassment that the church has become in our country, uh, of the shame that we wave around. <laughs> we get these stinky rags of sin and just put them in everybody's noses as if it's got perfume on it. We, we are a shame to the world for the despicable witness we have made of Christ. And so there's two kinds of Christians, two kinds of people, those who have seen the light and could never turn back, and those who are blind even now. Make sure, make your calling and election sure. Which one are you? Have your eyes been opened? If they are closed even now, repent, come to Christ. Let him heal your blindness. And with that, let us pray, and then we will take our wave offering together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are met with a, a difficult story. Lord, hard truths as presented in your word of what it really can cost a person to identify themselves with you and with your son. Father, help us to consider the cost, to count the cost of following you and marching towards your kingdom. Help us to be ready to shed whatever is holding us back. Help us to be ready to confront our own sin and our own wickedness that we might shine ever brighter for you. Father, help us more and more to be like this man who was born blind and yet you healed him. Help us to be like him and who even in his limited knowledge was able to be a witness to the light of Jesus Christ. Father, this is our prayer. I hope it is the prayer of all of us. In Jesus' name, amen.